When most people go to buy a home, they rely on their bank to see how big of a home they can qualify for. But if you're blindly trusting the bank's judgment as to how big of a home you can afford, you are setting yourself up for financial disaster. I'll show you. If you were considering buying a $500,000 home, your bank is going to look at four different factors. They're going to look at your assets. They're going to look at your credit score. They're going to look at your debts. And then they're going to look at your income. But when it comes to looking at how much money the bank will actually give you, the two main factors the bank is going to look at is your income and the other debts that you have. And then the bank is going to apply two different rules. They're going to apply the 2836 rule. And then they might even apply the 43% DTI rule. Both of these are spend first rules. You'll see why that matters in just a couple of minutes, but the 2836 rule, which is the recommended measure to how big of a home you can buy by banks, says that you can spend up to 28% of your gross monthly income on housing costs and 36% of your gross monthly income on all of your debts in total. Here's what those numbers look like. If you and your spouse make $100,000 a year in total between you two, the first thing you're going to pay is well, taxes. You're going to pay $20,000 in taxes. And then the bank says you can spend $28,000, 28% of your gross income before tax income on your housing costs. That's $28,000. And then an additional $8,000 on all of your other debts, which leaves you with $44,000 to spend, save, and invest. But what does that actually mean? If you can spend $28,000 a year on your housing costs, that means you have $2,350 a month, not just to spend on your mortgage, but also your property taxes and your insurance. If we assume that your property taxes and insurance will cost you about $500 a month, that means you can spend $1,850 a month on your mortgage. If we look at today's mortgage rates, if you were paying about 7% a year on your mortgage and you get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, that means you can go out and borrow $275,000 dollars to go out and buy a home based off of this income following the 2836 rule. At this point, what you see a lot of people in America say is, oh, uh, I was hoping that I could buy a little bit of a bigger home because the $275,000 that we have to borrow plus our down payment doesn't give me and my spouse the home that we were really hoping for. And that's where the banks will break out the big guns. They're going to unleash the 43% debt to income rule, the 43% DTI rule, which says that you can spend a total of up to 43% of your total gross income before taxes on debt costs. And so now the bank is going to look at all of your other debts. And if you don't have any other debts, then technically you can spend all 43% of your total gross income on paying your mortgage and housing costs. So if you really wanted to max it out, some lenders will say, okay, you're making $100,000 a year in household income. You got to pay $20,000 in taxes, but then you can spend another $43,000 on your housing costs, which leaves you $37,000 a year to spend, save, and invest. That means now instead of paying $2,350 a month in all of your housing costs, you can pay almost $3,600 a month in housing costs. And if we assume that your property taxes and insurance are going to cost you $500 a month. That means you can go out and borrow $460,000 to go out and buy your big home. See, the problem here of following the bank's recommended guidelines or available guidelines of how much money that you can borrow is, well, both of these are spend first guidelines, which kind of makes sense because the bank is in the business of putting you in debt because the more debt that you are in, the more money the bank makes. Right? The bank is in the business of making money, not for you, but for the bank. And the way that the bank makes money is by keeping you in debt as long as possible and giving you as much debt as possible because that's bigger profits for the bank. And so when most people follow the bank's recommended guidelines or the bank's potential available guidelines, they end up financially stuck. Now, when I say most Americans end up financially stuck, I don't mean this in an ambiguous way. I mean, they literally end up financially stuck. I'll show you. Let's go with the bank's recommended guidelines following the 2836 rule, which says now you're making $100,000 a year, 20,000 is going to taxes, 28,000 is going to housing costs, 8,000 on other payments, which leaves you $44,000 a year to spend, which is $3,667 a a month. Now, after you pay your mortgage, your taxes, and your insurance, you still have all of your other payments to make. And let's assume now that you are a family of three who's making the 
average payments or maybe a little bit less than average payments on everything else. Here's what that looks like. First, you got to pay the utilities for your home because that's not included in the housing cost numbers. You got to pay your gas, your electricity and water, let's say $250 a month. You got to pay for fuel in your car, $150 a month. You got to pay for your car insurance, let's say $358 a month. You got to pay for your family's cell phone bills, that's $166 a month. You got to pay for your house's internet, $58 a month. You got to pay for your family's groceries, $900 a month. You you got to pay for entertainment and restaurants. That's $400 a month. You got to pay for your general shopping and personal care. That's say $250 a month. You got to pay for travel, just $250 a month. And then you got to pay for your family's health care, $456 a month, which brings us to a total expenses of $3,238 a month, leaving you with $429 a month. That means if you don't try to max it out and you just try to follow the bank's recommended plan, you are going to have less than 5 percent of your total income left over to invest for your retirement, to save for your kid's college fund, to pay for a nice watch, assuming that you never have anything unexpected come up, that you never have to go to a birthday party and buy a birthday gift, that you never have to go to a wedding and pay for a wedding gift, that you never have to go to an unexpected bachelor or bachelorette party, that you never have any unexpected car maintenance, that you never have a window break, and that your kid never gets sick. Not to mention that these numbers are assuming that when you move into your home, you're going to have zero upgrade requirements and you're going to have zero maintenance issues on your home, which if you've ever lived in a home before, things break. And these numbers that I just gave you are based off of the bank's recommended guidance as to how big of a home that you could buy. Imagine if you went out and you tried to max out how big of a home that you could buy. If you follow the bank's recommended rules, which are spend first rules, you are going to stay in debt to the bank, which is great for the bank's but it's not so good news for you because their goal is to keep you in debt because that's how they make money. Now, before I go over how big of a home you can actually afford, let me make sure this is completely clear. There's nothing wrong with you going out and buying a home, but there is something wrong with you not having the ability to invest and build wealth because you decided to buy a home. So how big of a home can you actually afford? Well, what I'm saying is instead of following the bank's spend first rules, I'm saying that you should follow an invest first rule but I'm getting ahead of myself. There are three things that you need to look at to see how big of a home that you can afford. Number one is, can you afford the monthly payment? Number two is, can you afford the down payment? And number three is, can you afford the move-in costs? Because let me tell you, anytime you buy a home, not only do you have to pay movers, which can be expensive to get your stuff into that home, but then when you move in, you might want to make upgrades. You might want to finish the basement. You might want to upgrade the kitchen. And then you might want to get some furniture too to match the new blinds that you have in your home. If we start with how big of a monthly payment that you can afford, you need to start by building a financial system for yourself that will always have you saving and investing your money before you spend your money. A simple way to do this is to follow something like my 75, 15, 10 plan, which says that for every dollar that you earn from here on out, 75 cents is the maximum that you can spend. 15 cents is the minimum that you invest. And 10 10 cents is the minimum that you save. When you follow a rule like this, you're paying yourself first by investing your money first, saving your money first, and then you spend based off of whatever's left. You spend that 75 cents out of every dollar that you earn. That's the maximum that you can spend. And within that, your housing costs, your car costs, your gas costs, your food costs, and everything else has to fit. So let's diagram this out. So if you make $100,000 a year, you got to pay $20,000 in taxes, which leaves you with $80,000 that you're going to split 75, 15, 10. 10. That means that you have to invest a minimum of $12,000. You got to save a minimum of $8,000. And then you can spend $60,000 for everything else. This is where now it's your job to make the numbers fit within these parameters where you're investing and saving your money first. So let's run the numbers. If you can spend a maximum of $60,000 a year, that leaves you with $5,000 a month to spend. And if we stick with the same expense numbers that we had just a minute ago, that means you're spending $3,238 on all of your expenses, which leaves you with $1,762 a month on housing. That means after you account for property taxes and insurance, you might only be able to borrow $200,000 to go out and buy a home. But here's the beauty. You can adjust your expenses to fit whatever your needs are. If you really want a bigger home and you're willing to sacrifice eating at restaurants and you're willing to sacrifice your travel, fine. Just make it fit within your invest first parameters. See, the reason why this has become so difficult is because number one, houses have become so expensive. And then number two, people want bigger and nicer and grander homes. And so now when you compare the two things, I want more home and I have less money to spend, it doesn't really work together, which means most people don't want to make that sacrifice. 
And what happens then? People end up sacrificing the ability to invest. They sacrifice the ability to save just so they can go out and buy a bigger home, which isn't putting any money in your pocket because your home is not an asset. But I'm getting ahead of myself again. I'll get to that in just a bit. But the second thing that you have to make sure that you can afford is your down payment. And the thing that I want to mention about this is I'm going to treat you like adults here, okay? The bigger the down payment, the more skin you have in the game and the less fees that you can pay. When you go on and get a mortgage, if you put down a very small down payment, you generally are going to have to pay additional fees, things like PMI, things like different insurances, potentially other fees to now compensate for the additional risk. Because when the bank see you putting a smaller down payment, it's a bigger risk for the bank because now in case you stop paying, you don't have that much skin in the game to continue trying to make the payments and there's a higher chance that you go into foreclosure. So to protect the banks, they're going to charge you with additional fees. Now, the whole thing here is if you put down a 20% down payment, you can avoid those additional fees, but that means you're going to have to have that additional money to actually put down towards your home. If you want to buy a home, the financially sound way, have a bigger down payment. But you might be thinking, but just breathe. I can use that additional money to invest in rental properties. I can use that money to go out and invest in stocks. I can use that money to build my business or do something else. And this is where I'm going to treat you like an adult and have you understand if you put down a smaller down payment, well, there's a risk associated with that when it comes to buying a home. And if you're just putting on a smaller down payment so you can go out and buy a bigger home, you're doing it the wrong way. But if you're putting down a smaller down payment, that way you can use that additional down payment money that you would have used for your home to go out and build your wealth. Okay, but I want you to understand the risks. I want you to understand that if you put down 20%, you're going to save more money on the home. And I want you to understand that if you're putting down a smaller down payment, there is a higher chance that you can go into foreclosure. So... I'm going to treat you like adults here. I want you to understand the way that it works. And if you want to be able to buy a home, the bigger the down payment, the safer you are in the home, as in the less chance of you actually going into foreclosure. But I'm going to leave that up to you as to how you want to actually play that. And the third factor that you're going to have to afford is the move-in costs. Because here's what's going to happen. You're going to walk into the home with your wife or your husband. And then your wife's going to look around and say, oh my God, what a beautiful home. Look at these blinds. Oh, I love the living room. I love the white kitchen. But now, what's going to happen? Oh, you got to upgrade the appliances in the kitchen. You got to have a new dishwasher to match the grandness of the kitchen. Don't forget the bigger TV that you got to put up on the living room wall because now you got to watch the games over there. And you got to have the nicer sofas to match the blinds. All these things are expensive. And I want you to account for these moving costs because what ends up happening to so many people is you move into a home and then you realize, holy crap, movers are expensive. And oh my God, my wife wants a lot of things for my home or my husband wants a lot of things for my home. And these things are costly and you don't want to just start suddenly going into debt, 0% APR, buy now, pay later, trying to finance all the new equipment, all the new appliances and all the new furniture. Because let me tell you something, furniture is expensive. Have you looked at the prices of mattresses lately? They are very expensive. And so you want to make sure you're budgeting that, have the cash aside to be able to buy these things with cash within your invest first parameters. And so this is where if you're going out to buy a home, understand these different costs before you go out and actually purchase the home. And this is where everybody says, but just breathe. You talk about 75, 15, 10 as in spend, invest, save. Isn't me paying down my mortgage a type of investment? Am I not investing when I'm buying this home? No, your home that you buy to live in is a liability. Treat it like a piece of shirt. Treat it like a piece of cloth. You're buying it to use. Sure, can it make you money? Absolutely. But there's no guarantees that it's going to make you money. We've seen home prices go up. We've also seen home prices go down. And so your home becomes a money pit until you ultimately sell it. We're all told that your home is the biggest investment. Why are we told that? Because, well, when realtors are trying to sell you a home, they want you to buy a bigger home because the bigger home you buy, the bigger commission check they get. I'm telling you this because I am a licensed realtor and... You know what? If we can tell you that your home is a great investment, you're going to want to buy a little bit bigger because now you can build generational wealth. But it's not their fault. They're in the interest of trying to sell you your dream home, the beautiful home that you want. Same with bankers. Well, bankers get paid on commission too. The more money you borrow, the more money they make, which is why if you really want to get that bigger home, they're going to do whatever they can to pull some strings to get the underwriters to get you approved to buy that bigger home. 
It's not in their best interest to make sure that you're financially sound, to make sure that you have money to invest. They just want their commission check. That doesn't make them a bad person, but you have to understand now your duty, your best interest. Your best interest is to make sure that you can buy a home that you can afford while still having the ability to invest, while still having the ability to save. And if you just follow a spend first model as to how big of a home that you can buy, you are going to lose the ability to invest just so you can own a home. And by the way, when you're paying your mortgage payments to your home, you might think that you're building equity. You might think that you're building ownership in this property that you can pass down with generational wealth. Well, if you go out and you get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, more than half of your mortgage payment for the first 14 years is going to be going directly into your banker's pockets with interest. Meaning for the first year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six, year seven, year eight, year nine, year 10, year 11, year 12, year 13, and year 14, the majority of your interest payments, the majority of your payments to the bank is going directly into your banker's pocket and it's not building you equity. Now, sure, is it nice to have a paid down house? Yeah. Is it nice to not have to make any more mortgage payments? Yeah. But is it nice to do that at the sacrifice, at the detriment of your ability to actually invest into other places that can make you money? No, your home is a money pit until you sell it because now when you're living in your home, you're going to want to make upgrades. You got to pay the property taxes. You got to pay the insurance. Every time something breaks, you're going to have to fix it. And until you sell, you're not going to see a penny. And then when you sell, you have to hope that you can sell it for a profit. And then when you sell, you also lose the home. Compare that to going out and buying a rental property where now you have tenants that are paying for your expenses. Yeah, you still got to pay for your upgrades. You still got to pay for the property taxes. You still got to pay for the insurance. But the rental income from the property is paying for all your expenses and putting some money in your pocket each and every month. It's a completely different way of analyzing the deal. See, when you go out and buy a home, you don't go in thinking, oh, how much can I sell this home for in the future? Because if you are, well, you might be disappointed because you never know where home prices are going to be when it comes time for you to sell. But when you go out and you buy a rental property, you're going out and you're thinking, how much money is this property going to make me? When you buy a home, you're thinking about the memories. When you buy a rental property, you're thinking about the money. So your home that you live in, treat it like a liability. Treat it like any other expense that maybe you can sell it for a profit in the future. But the key, the major key here is that when you go out and buy a home, you are not sacrificing your ability to build true wealth true generational wealth outside of your home just because you wanted to go out and buy a home. And if you still don't believe me, go out and talk to any wealthy person in the world and ask them how they did it. And what you'll notice is nobody, none of them became wealthy because they paid off of their home. They became wealthy because they were investing in real estate. They became wealthy because they were investing in stocks. They became wealthy because they were investing in businesses or they became wealthy because they built their own business. That's how people become wealthy. It's not just because they pay down their home. It's nice to have a pay down home. It's nice to own a home, but it's not nice to do that at the expense of not being able to build your own wealth. This brings me to the next question. How do you actually get qualified for a mortgage? If you're thinking about buying a home, you need to know how to get pre-qualified for a mortgage. That way you can actually get the money to go out and buy a home. And there are five things that your bank is going to look at or that your lender is going to look at when it comes to getting you pre-qualified. Number one is your income. Number two are your assets. Number three is your credit score. Number four is your debts. And number five is the type of loan that you want. Are you getting a conventional loan? Are you getting an FHA loan? Are you getting a jumbo loan? Are you getting a VA loan? Are you getting a USDA loan? We're going to go into each one of these five factors, let me start by talking about number one, which is taking a look at your income. This one is the most self-explanatory. Banks want to make sure that you have an income and a stable income that's going to allow you to keep making the payments because it's in the bank's best interest to make sure that they get paid. And so how do they do that? They want to see that you have a stable income. And what does that mean? That means generally they want to see at least two years of stable income, steady, ideally from the same employer. If it's not from the same employer, they don't want to see a bunch of moving around. That could be a big red flag for them. But they want to see two years of at least steady income coming in where now you're getting paid and that you can afford the monthly payments. And in addition to that, if you are self-employed, if you are a business owner, you have your own business, you're an entrepreneur, they're going to still want to see those two years of steady employment, sometimes even a little bit longer. They try to be even more strict on entrepreneurs because they know that your income can be much more volatile than a steady paycheck. So they're going to be looking at how steady your income is. The second thing your bank is going to look at is your assets because the bank now wants to play the game of what happens in the worst case scenario if you lose your job. Do you have assets that you can sell or liquidate that will allow you to continue 
continue making the payments because the bank wants to make sure they get paid whether you're getting paid or not. If you lose your job, that doesn't matter. The bank needs to make sure that they get paid. So what are they going to look at? They're going to look at things like your checkings account and your savings accounts. They're going to see if you have any CDs. They're going to see if you own any stocks or if you own any bonds. They're going to see if you have a 401k or an IRA. They're going to see if you have any real estate investment holdings. And they're going to see if you have any other assets out there because if something bad were to happen, if the economy goes down and you lose your job, your debt payments don't go away. The bank is not going to forgive them. And so they want to make sure that if something bad were to happen to your job, that you can sell off these assets and continue paying the bank because the bank wants to make sure they're getting paid even if you're not getting paid. The third factor that your bank is going to look at is your credit score. Now, this one's interesting because the better your credit score, the less in fees that you're going to have to pay. Your credit score essentially tells the bank how qualified you are to make your payments on time. And if you are more qualified to make your payments on time, meaning you have a higher credit score, banks will generally reward you with a lower fee and a lower interest rate because you're less of a risk to the bank. You could think of it like when you go out to make an investment, if it's a super risky investment, like it's a gamble, you are going to expect higher potential returns. Yeah, you can lose money more likely, but your upside has to be a lot higher because you're making a bigger risk. Well, it's the same thing here. If the bank sees that you don't have a very good track record of paying things on time, they're going to have to justify that risk of investing money into you, meaning lending money to you, by taking on a higher return, by charging you a higher interest rate. So in general, if you want to get the best interest rates, the lowest mortgage rates possible, you want to have at least a credit score of 740 or higher. If you have a 740 credit score, that's going to open up the lowest and the best interest rates possible for you. But then some people are not going to have the 740 credit score. And the next question is, well, what are the minimum requirements that I need in order to qualify for a mortgage? And it's going to depend on what kind of mortgage that you get. So let's go over these based off of experience numbers. If you just want to get by and qualify for a conventional mortgage, you need a 620 credit score. If you want to get the jumbo mortgage, a larger mortgage, that's a 700 credit score. If you want an FHA mortgage and just get by, a 500 credit score can get you in the door. For the VA loan, a 620 credit score can get you in the door. And with a USDA credit score, a 580 credit score can get you in the door. If you're struggling with your credit score, there are ways and tricks and hacks that you can use to help raise your credit score quickly. I'm not going to go over all of them in this video. I've covered that on my channel. There's a bunch of resources on YouTube and on Google that you can learn about how to increase your credit score and that will help you qualify for lower mortgage rates but can save you a lot of money in the long term. The fourth factor that the bank is going to look at is debt and more particularly DTI which stands to debt to income and what they're going to take a look at is how much debt are you paying out every single month relative to the amount of money that you're making and then based off of that they might qualify you for a mortgage based off of well how much income you have relative to how much debt that you have the way that you can calculate your debt to income ratio is you take your total debt payments every single month and then you add in your mortgage costs or your rental costs and then you divide that by your gross monthly income your pre-tax income and that's going to give you your debt to income ratio here's an example of what that would look like let's assume that your debts are very simple you pay four hundred dollars a month for your car you pay a hundred dollars a month for your credit card and then you pay another fifteen hundred dollars a month for your rent that's a total monthly debt payment of two thousand dollars a month and if you make sixty thousand dollars a year in salary pre-tax that's five thousand dollars a month you would do your total debt payments of two thousand dollars a month divided by your gross monthly income which is five thousand dollars a month which gives you a debt to income ratio of forty percent now if we go onto the chase bank's website you'll see that what's considered a good debt to income ratio is forty three percent you've heard me talk about this a 43 percent debt to income ratio means that the banks are willing to lend you money generally up to 43 percent of the amount of money that you're making pre-tax so if you don't have any other debts you could in theory go out and spend 43 percent of your gross monthly income pre-tax on just your housing costs. Now, you don't need to be a financial genius to calculate that if you're spending 43% of your gross income pre-tax on your housing costs, and then you have to pay taxes, and then you have to pay for all of your other expenses, you're not really going to have much money left over to invest and save to build your wealth, which is why you don't want to blindly follow the bank's spend-first guidelines, and instead you want to build your own guidelines, which 
force you to invest your money and save your money first, and then you spend whatever's left. And this brings me to the fifth factor, which is what type of loan are you trying to qualify for? Because different loans are going to have different qualification rules. There are five main general categories of loans that I'm going to talk about today. You have the conventional loans, you got the jumbo loans, you got the FHA loans, you got the VA loans, and then you got the USDA loans. Let's start by talking about the conventional loans. If you get a conventional loan, the general rule of thumb is that you're going to have to put down 20% as a down payment to get and qualify for a conventional loan. Now, does that mean you have to put down 20%? No, that's the general rule. You can put down a lower down payment, a significantly lower down payment, but because most conventional loans are not backed by the government, if you do not put down 20% as your down payment, you're going to have to pay an additional fee or fine called PMI, private mortgage insurance. And what that means now is if you put down a smaller down payment, let's say you only put down 10% to go out and buy a home. Well, if you put down 10%, you are a bigger risk to the bank of foreclosing because if home values drop and you lose your job, well, you might be underwater on a home and you might not have the same ability or interest to continue making your payments, which means you are a higher risk of foreclosure. Now, to protect the bank from a foreclosure and the cost of foreclosure, the bank will get insurance on you. But the insurance that the bank gets is paid by you, not the bank. That's what PMI is. So if you get a conventional loan and you're putting down less than 20%, you're going to have to pay for your mortgage, your property taxes, and then PMI on top of that. But once you hit that 20% equity, the PMI will generally go away. A jumbo loan is also pretty self-explanatory. If you want to borrow more money to go out and buy a home, you're going to get a jumbo loan. The size of the jumbo loan is going to depend on where you live, on what qualifies for a jumbo loan. Some areas are more than others because New York is much more expensive than, say, rural Idaho. But if you want to borrow more money, you're going to have to get a jumbo loan. Jumbo loans generally have higher down payment requirements and a little bit stricter on the credit score requirements because if you're borrowing more money, banks want to make sure that you're a good investment. The third type of loan and another very popular type of loan are FHA loans. FHA loans are loans that are backed by the government. And because they're backed by the government, you have easier qualifications in order to get approved for an FHA loan because if you were to default, your bank is not the one that's going to bear the burden of that. It's the government because the government will put in the backstops and pretty much guarantee your loan. If you want to qualify for an FHA loan, you generally have a minimum down payment requirement of 3.5%, but you also have an insurance fee that you have to pay with FHA. But unlike a conventional loan, if you get an FHA loan, that insurance fee or payment that you have to make does not go away once you have 20% equity in your home. That insurance payment is going to stay for the life of your loan unless you refinance into a conventional loan. But generally speaking, that insurance payment will stay there for the life of your FHA loan. Then you have the VA loans. This is for current and former military members. The VA loans have a lot of special perks because you served in the military. One of them includes that you have the ability to have 0% down payment mortgages. Plus, you don't have to worry about paying PMI or anything like that. And they have a little bit of easier access in order to qualify for a mortgage. Plus, sometimes you can also get lower mortgage rates with a VA loan. And then you have the USDA loans, which was kind of an incentive created to encourage people to go out and buy homes in rural areas. And they're also there to help people in suburban areas who are very low income. So if you are low income in a suburban area or you're looking to buy a home in a rural area, you can potentially qualify for a USDA loan. USDA loans also have that same benefit where you can potentially buy a home with a 0% down payment. So now you have a lot of different options out there. Talk to a smart mortgage broker to see what's the right option for you. The most important thing isn't what type of loan that you get. It is that you can afford your monthly payment. It's that you can afford the down payment and that you can afford the move-in costs because if you're going out and buying a home just to buy it and now you're sacrificing your ability to build wealth by investing your money and saving your money because you're living paycheck to paycheck just to make the monthly payments in your home, you're doing it the wrong way. The key to buying a home the right way is that you can buy a home that you can afford, that you can live in, and that's not going to sacrifice your ability to build wealth. This is where you also want to pay attention to what affects home prices. Because if you're going out to buy a home, you might be wondering, well, what's going to happen with home prices in the future? The housing market is always drawing a lot of emotion. Some people say that the housing market's going to crash. Some people say that the housing market's going to boom. Some people say that the housing market's going to get more unaffordable. Some people say that we're going to see the biggest opportunity in housing ever in the near future. But what you need to understand now isn't all the emotion in the housing market, but rather what affects home prices? And the real factor that affects home prices isn't just the Federal Reserve Bank. It isn't just inflation. It isn't just the economy. It's supply and demand, just like any other asset class. See, your home isn't worth 
what you list it for, it's worth what somebody else is willing to pay. Because if you think your home is worth $400,000 because a very smart agent said that your home is worth $400,000 and then you get 44 offers and somebody's willing to pay you $475,000, are you going to say, you know what, agent, I trust your judgment. I'm just going to sell my home for $400,000? No, you're going to sell it for $475,000. You're going to sell it to the highest bidder. So your home is worth what somebody else is willing to pay. But that can also work on the opposite side where you think your home is worth $400,000, but the highest offer you're getting is $335,000. Now, is your home worth $400,000? Maybe if you're willing to wait it out and wait for somebody to make an offer higher. But if you're not getting any other offers and you sell it for $335,000, then your home's only worth $335,000. And this is where you have to understand what are the factors that influence the housing market? And that goes to supply and demand. But in order to actually understand this, you have to understand what factors influence demand and what factors influence supply. Because if you have more supply than demand, what that means is you have more sellers than buyers, that's going to push home prices lower. Because if you only have five buyers for the 500 homes that are for sale, now these sellers are going to have to compete against each other to get one of these buyers to buy one of their homes. How do the sellers compete against one another? Well, they compete by cutting the prices of their homes. That is called a buyer's market. That's what we saw after the 2008 crash in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. That was a buyer's market because you had all these foreclosures, you had all these sellers, but nobody really going out and buying homes, which meant if you were a buyer, you had all the negotiating room and the leverage. A seller's market is the opposite. It's when you have a lot of buyers, a lot of demand, and not that much supply. That's what we've been seeing in 2020, 2021, 2022, where we have a whole bunch of buyers who want to buy a home, but not that much inventory, not that many sellers. And so now the buyers are competing against each other. How do buyers compete against each other? All by willing to pay higher prices or by bidding against one another. So now when you have 500 buyers and only five homes available for sale, these 500 buyers have to bid against each other by upping their asking price in order to buy a home. This is why you have to understand which factors are going to influence demand and which factors are going to influence supply. And if we start with the demand side, the most obvious factor that influences demand is interest rates, mortgage rates. Because when you have lower mortgage rates, you have more buyers. When you have higher mortgage rates, you have less buyers. This is what the Federal Reserve Bank is using to try to cool inflation because the Federal Reserve Bank wants home prices to not grow so aggressively. How are they doing that? By raising interest rates, which is pushing mortgage rates higher, which makes it less affordable to buy a home. And when homes become less affordable, less buyers are out in the market to go out and actually buy a home. And to demonstrate what I mean, think about this. If mortgage rates fell to 3% tomorrow, what would happen? Your mom, your dad, your cousin, your sister, everybody will be going out trying to buy another home. Why? Because mortgage rates fell and people want to capitalize on the lower mortgage rates to go out and buy a home, which means now you're going to have buyers flooding the market and we still have a very low inventory of homes for sale, which means you're going to see the bidding wars come back into the market, pushing home prices higher. So mortgage rates play a big factor on demand, but also the economy plays a big factor in demand because when you see an economic slowdown, that means you have less jobs. That means you have people getting laid off. That means you have people worried about their incomes. And when you have that type of economic slowdown or people worried about an economic slowdown, the last thing people want to do is go out and get a home because that's a big financial commitment. And if you're worried about getting laid off, you don't want to go out and make a new big purchase because you don't know what's going to happen to your income tomorrow. And that's where you have to understand the economy plays a factor in demand, number one, in sentiment, but number two, with also incomes, because if incomes are falling or if people are getting laid off or if people are losing their jobs, that's less demand out there to buy a home. Now, today, we're still in a very strong economy. Now, part of that has to do with all the money printing that we saw in 2020, 2021, and into 2022, but our economy still has a lot of jobs. And so that still has the ability for people to go out and purchase a home, which is where if that starts to flip in 2024 or 2025, that could also impact demand where higher interest rates cool down demand and a slower economy also cools down demand. And the third factor that generally influences demand is really just consumer interest. Because what happened during the pandemic was people went from living in cities to now all of a sudden working from home. 
And today, yeah, people are going back into the office, but we still have a lot of people that are working from home or working a hybrid environment, which meant a lot of people wanted to get a new home with an office, or they wanted to upgrade their home because people are spending more and more time at home. And so because of that, the consumer interest started to change and people wanted to upgrade a home. They wanted a home with an office or they wanted a home with additional bedrooms that way they could spend more time at home. And that change in consumer interest also boosted up demand because now all of a sudden people wanted to own and people wanted to own something where they could also work from. So the three factors, the three main factors that will influence demand are mortgage rates, it's the economy, and consumer demand. Then you have to look at the supply side. What factors influence supply? Well, the first factor that influences supply is really just what are forced sales? A forced sale is something like a foreclosure. Because if you're seeing foreclosures happen, you're going to see an increase in the supply of homes out there. But up until now, we've covered this in market briefs, there really hasn't been that many foreclosures. I know some people talk about how foreclosures have been rising, but in reality, generally, there has been no real need for foreclosures in the last few years because home prices have gone up. So if you lost your job, you lost your income, you no longer have the ability to make the payments on your home and you're way in over your head on your home, well, it doesn't make sense for you to go into foreclosure because a lot of people, most Americans, have some sort of positive equity or even zero equity in their homes, which means you can sell your home, walk away, and maybe put some cash in your pocket, which means it doesn't really make sense for you to go into foreclosure. That's where the first part that you want to pay attention to on the supply side is forced sales. We're not seeing any of those forced sales. If home prices start to go down more drastically and more people became underwater on their homes, then if you see a slowing economy, that would also impact supply because now if people become underwater and they lose their jobs, now people can't just walk away and put cash in their pocket. So that's the first factor you want to pay attention to on supply. The second factor that influences supply is home building. But when a home builder or a home developer wants to go out and buy a home, what they want to see is, am I going to make any money by me going out and investing millions of dollars to build this neighborhood, to build this apartment complex, to build this development? And if they project growth in the economy, they project growth in home prices, they're going to be much more likely to go out and build a home because building a home takes months, sometimes even years, depending on how big the property is. And now you have to play through the scenario. If I'm going to invest, let's just say $10 million to build this neighborhood of homes, I want to make sure that I can make at least $12 million from sales of this property. That way I can actually make some money as a developer, as a builder. And that's going to compensate for my risk, for my time, for my investment, and for everything in between. Now, when I go out and I start projecting this, I'm going to look at what are home prices today? Okay, I'll be able to sell these homes for $450,000 today. Do I think I'm going to be able to sell these homes for $460,000 next year when they're completed? Or are they going to sell for less than $450,000? And this is where now home builders and developers are saying, oh, we're seeing downward pressure on the housing market. We're seeing downward pressure on home prices. We're not seeing the same growth in home prices, which is less incentive for me to go out and build a home because that's a lot of risk. I don't want to go out and take on all these loans, take on all this risk and spend all this time trying to build this neighborhood as charity. I want to make some money off of it. And if I end up losing money, that's going to be very bad. So supply, meaning building, depends a lot on consumer sentiment because if home builders believe that they're going to be able to sell their homes for big profits, they're going to want to build more and capitalize on those profits. If they don't think they're going to be able to sell them for big profits, they're going to be much less likely to build homes. And then sometimes you have the X factor, the government factor, which can influence this home building sentiment because sometimes you can see the government come out and say that they're going to create incentives or subsidies for builders to go out and invest in neighborhoods to go out and build homes. But beyond that, the factor that influences how many homes get created is really ultimately up to what is the sentiment in the economy and do builders feel confident to actually go out and continue building homes. And then the last factor that influences supply is people's interest in selling. If people are going to make a big profit from selling their homes, they're going to want to sell, although they're still going to need another place to go out and live. But if people are going to lose money on their home by selling, they're not going to want to sell. 
So the three factors that influence supply are number one, are people going to make money when they sell? Number two, what is home builder sentiment? And number three, are we seeing forced sales? Things like foreclosures, which impact the amount of supply that we have. So now what you want to do, if you want to understand the housing market, you want to get a gauge for where the economy is going, for where the housing market is going. You want to compare the factors that influence supply and measure them against the factors that influence demand and then see when is demand and supply going to level off? Because today... We have demand here and supply here. We still have higher demand than supply. A couple of years ago, we had demand way up here and supply down here, which meant you had all these bidding wars because you had way more buyers and sellers. Now demand has come down, but it's still higher than supply. But when will these factors even up? And are we going to see things where supply goes higher than demand. If supply starts to go higher than demand, that can pull home prices lower. If demand stays a lot higher than supply, that will continue to push home prices higher. But it's not just interest rates. It's not just the economy. It's all these factors on the demand and supply side together, which is why you want to make a holistic picture of the economy and the housing market and play it into one another. That way you can get a better idea of where home prices are going. Now, with that information in mind, let's take a look at what's happening in the economy right now. More and more people People with money are predicting that there's going to be economic pain ahead. How do I know? Take a look at this Market Watch article. It's titled, We've Never Seen This Before. Banks are sitting on tons of cash, sitting idle, waiting for the right opportunity. But here's the interesting part. It's not just banks that are doing this. It's high net worth individuals as well. Take a look. High net worth individuals are putting more money into short-term cash allocation, checkings accounts, savings accounts, and CDs. And it's not just the fact that people and institutions with money are starting to save money. It's the rate at which they're saving money. Take a look at the statistic. High net worth individuals stored 34% of their wealth in cash and cash equivalents in 2022 which is up 10% from 2021. Now you have to ask the question, why are more people, why are people with money, why are banks, why are investment funds starting to store more cash? Because if you think about it, cash doesn't do anything. I mean, if anything, cash loses value. If you put $100 in your back pocket today and you left it there, that $100 is going to have less buying power a year from now. Why? Because inflation exists. Inflation means the prices of things are going up. And so if the prices of things are going up, that $100 has a buying power. So why are we seeing more and more banks, more and more high net worth individuals sitting on cash, storing cash, and in some instances, keeping this cash in places where it's not generating any return? Because when a bank is storing cash, that means they're not getting any money. They're not getting any return because banks are in the business of lending money. And when they're storing cash, that's dead money. That's a dead asset that's not producing a return for them. And banks want their money to be alive. They want to lend it out and continue to get a return. So why are banks doing that? Well, banks are getting worried about making loans. They're worried about what's happening in the economy and they're worried that people might not be able to continue making the loans in the future. And for high net worth individuals, they're looking at what's happening in the economy and they're saying, well, if I keep my money in cash or if I keep my money in a CD, that is a better return for me right now than me going out and investing the money because there's risk with me investing the money. And if I'm seeing potential headwinds against the economy, I'm not going to want to take that risk. If I think that we might see the stock market fall, we might see the real estate market fall, I'm not going to take my money that's sitting in my high interest savings account paying 3 4% interest or my CD paying 4.5% interest, take that money out and risk it where maybe I'm going to get a 7% return, but maybe I might see this money fall. And if... The opposite was going on. If people said, I think the economy is going to boom. I think that we're going to see a lot of growth in the markets in the coming years. No one's going to want to keep their money in a high interest savings account or in a CD where you're earning 3, 4, 5% because you're going to say, shoot, I'm going to get 10, 12, 15% returns in the markets. Why would I want to keep my money into these high interest savings accounts or CDs or checkings accounts or savings accounts? And that would entice people to want to pull money out. It would entice banks to want to lend money because you think that the economy is looking stronger tomorrow. But what we're starting to see happen is a change in sentiment. And it's not just what people feel, it's what people are doing with their money because we're seeing more banks, we're seeing more high net worth individuals that are keeping this cash aside just in case. Now, yeah, at least we're getting some sort of return on our money, but people are looking at the market saying things are expensive. The markets are overvalued. The markets are really 
kind of struggling to keep up. I mean, the economy is starting to slow down. We're starting to see all these different things happening in the economy. Do I really want to deploy all of my money right now and potentially miss out on opportunities in the future? And this is the question that more and more people are asking. And what we're starting to see happen statistically is more and more people are starting to pad these savings accounts. That way, in case something bad was to happen in the economy, well, now you have this, what people call dry powder. You have this ammunition to go out and buy investments when they start to fall. Even Charlie Munger, who was Warren Buffett's right-hand man, recently came out in an interview and said that he still believes that we're going to see some sort of recession, even if it's just a mild recession in the near future. He went on to say that one of the biggest causes that he believes was going to trigger this mild recession is commercial real estate. What he had to say was every bank in the country is way tighter on real estate loans today than they were six months ago. And the reason why he's concerned about the commercial real estate market is because of all the changes that we've seen happen in the commercial real estate market. We've seen so many offices sit vacant or half vacant because people have been working from home or people have been working hybridly. And now what we're seeing is that in the coming 24 months, we're going to see a huge chunk, upwards of 50% of all of our commercial real estate loans readjust because commercial real estate loans are not 30-year fixed rate mortgages. Many of them are going to readjust in the coming 24 months. And so now if you own an office building and your original loan was at 3.5% and now it's going to come and readjust at 7.5%, that means your payments are going to go up. Now, normally that's not a big deal because what you would do is you would just raise the rent on your tenants. You would raise the rents on your offices, on your businesses that are renting your office space. But if your offices are sitting half vacant, who are you going to raise the rent on? You're going to push more people out of the office. And that's the big concern that Charlie Munger is saying that he sees coming. And so we definitely have a whole bunch of different red flags in our economy right now. The question is, what's going to happen between now and then? Because currently, we have high interest rates. Currently, the Federal Reserve Bank is saying that they're going to work to continue raising interest rates. But what's going to happen in 12 months? Is the Fed going to continue raising interest rates? Are they going to continue keeping interest rates high? Or are they going to say our economy is slowing faster than expected and we need to start cutting interest rates? We don't know this. And that's where we have all these different question marks as to where the economy is going to go. But unlike previous economic slowdowns, we are still facing high inflation. And so the Federal Reserve Bank has to be much more diligent with interest rates, and they don't have the same flexibility to start cutting interest rates as quickly without any consequences. Because if the Fed started to cut interest rates tomorrow and mortgage rates fell to 3%, you're going to see a huge flood of people into the housing market. If people started flooding into the housing market, home prices are going to go up because now buyers are going to be bidding against each other to buy a home. And if home prices start to go up very quickly, now the inflation problem becomes worse again. So we have all these cyclical issues. Our entire economy is completely tied together because while the higher interest rates would make home prices less affordable, it could make offices more affordable because the commercial landlords are struggling. This is one of the things that we've been discussing pretty often in market breaks. Briefs. Market Briefs is my free daily newsletter where my team is breaking down what's happening in things like the housing market, the economy, the stock market, the global economy, and the cryptocurrency market into a fun, witty, and easy to read email. If you have not joined Market Briefs yet, I highly recommend you do so because number one, it's free. And number two, well, if you don't love it, you can just unsubscribe so you have nothing to lose. So if you have not joined Market Briefs yet, you can go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash market. And I also got the link for you down in the description below. But if we quickly go back to the topic of commercial real estate loans, here's what Charlie Munger had to say. Charlie Munger said that the commercial property loans held by U.S. banks are now going to be deemed, quote, bad loans, or many of them are going to be deemed bad loans because of declining property values, meaning commercial real estate prices will be falling, people will have more debt, then commercial landlords will become underwater, and they won't have the ability to continue making the payments, which is why he said that they will be called, quote, bad loans. But it's not just commercial real estate. We are seeing different headwinds in different parts of the economy. Like if we take a look at the Airbnb business, which is a big part of the travel business now, Airbnb has been seeing their demand for rentals start to fall. And there's a couple different factors having to do with that. Number one is when people were completely virtual, people wanted to travel more because now you could work from anywhere in the world and just enjoy and work. 
But now we're starting to see that shift where more and more employers are saying, you got to get back into the office. If it's not five days a week, maybe it's four days a week, maybe it's three days a week, where more and more employers are asking employees to get back into the office. And if they're not asking, they're demanding. And that's where now people don't have the same ability to travel. They don't have the same ability to work in different parts of the country like they could before. That's one factor that has been impacting the Airbnb business, which hurts travel, which hurts different types of spending. But then in addition to that, we're also seeing just less demand for travel. Part of the reason why is because the cost of travel has gone up so much along with the cost of everything else. We've seen grocery prices get more expensive. We've seen housing costs get more expensive. We've seen cars get more expensive. We're starting to see some relief in the car market, but in general, cars are still way more expensive today than they were a few years ago. And so when you have the prices of things constantly rising, eventually people are going to have to say, you know what, either I'm going to have to go into debt to finance this vacation or I'm just going to cut back on my vacation. Maybe we go for a shorter vacation or maybe we just go on this vacation next year. And that's one of the things that Airbnb is starting to see that the demand for travel is starting to fall. Part of it has to do with the changing work environment and part of it has to do with just the rising cost of travel. Flight costs have gone up, restaurant costs have gone up, and so it's much more expensive if you have a family of four or even two people and you're going out and traveling, the cost to go out and travel is getting much more expensive. And if it's not Airbnb, you can take a look at what Nike is seeing. Nike recently came out and talked about their latest earnings and what they were talking about is how their profits have been impacted based off of what's happening in the economy. Here's what Thomas Montiero, a senior analyst at Invest Investing.com had to say about it. He said, Nike's latest earnings report makes it abundantly clear that the United States economy is in fact facing considerable headwinds, which is a bit of a cold blow after the recent very positive GDP figures. I think the main takeaway here is that investors should take this threat seriously going forward. Now you're probably wondering, what were the factors that hurt Nike's profitability? Well, it was the higher inflation causing their cost to go up, but then also second, the inability to continue raising prices of their products and also having to cut some of the prices of their products. Let me show you. Nike's gross margins were impacted by, quote, higher product input costs and elevated freight and logistic costs, higher markdowns and continued unfavorable changes in net foreign currency exchange rates. What does that mean? So they had the issues of higher inflation. They had to pay higher money to produce their products, ship their products, and then they had to have higher markdowns on their shoes to continue getting people to keep buying their shoes and stuff. And then third, they had the foreign exchange issues. So what does all this mean? Well, we still have a lot of different factors that are coming through together in our economy. We're still facing the impacts of the high inflation. We're starting to feel the impacts of the higher interest rates, while it looks like interest rates are going to continue to go higher. And these two things together are playing an impact in the economy and people's spending ability is starting to change. We're seeing people's spending ability start to go down in certain areas that are more discretionary because your Nike shoes are more of a discretionary item. Travel is more of a discretionary item. You don't need it to survive. And we're starting to see people's spending abilities and habits change because of what's happening in the economy. And this is where understanding that changes in the economy like this they start off slow, but then it really just can be a domino. If something big were to happen, it can completely flip the sentiment and it can change the trajectory of the economy, which is why your job is really just to be prepared and to understand what's happening. Now, of course, we keep you updated on market briefs, but your job to be prepared means 2023 is not the year for you to go out and finance a new truck. 2023 is the year for you to get financially smart and then continue building your financial education and put money aside to number one, protect you against an emergency and number two, to be able to capitalize on opportunities that might be coming your way. There are three very clear points in my life where I learned a new piece of information which completely changed the trajectory of my life financially. And I'm gonna go over those three in this video. Number one was when I was 16 or 17 years old, I read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki and then I read Total Money Makeup over by Dave Ramsey. And that was the first 